In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've given us. Please pour the Holy Spirit's gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding upon us, that your light may shine in the darkness of our minds and our hearts, and that we may see things as they are. And we ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, I'm James, if you don't remember me. I don't have a name tag. I'm sorry. I don't know if I was supposed to. So, maybe I shouldn't be sorry. Don't know. But, yes, I'm the seminarian. So I'm studying to be a priest, and I'll be a deacon in June, so pray for me, because I need it. And you need prayers too, it's not exclusive. We are as one, in the words of Gladiator. <laughs> I'm a little delirious, you may have noticed, but we're going to do our best. We've got the commandments. There's ten of them, but today we're just going to work on the first three, which are really important, as are all the commandments, <laughs> because God said them. All right, so, first commandment. You may be wondering, what is that? Well, I wrote it down. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall not have other gods beside me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness of anything in the heavens above or on earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or serve them. Now you'd think this would be pretty straightforward. I was thinking that at least when I was preparing this. I was like, yes, there's one God. and You don't worship things as God that are not God. That seems pretty simple. And I still think it's simple, but I have to talk more about it. So, Roman Catechism, this is the Catechism of Trent. So this was in the 1500s. Um, they had the, the, the Catechism that you guys have is the up newer one, right? But uh, this is still a valid Catechism. And it says that the mandatory part of the command, the first commandment, contains a precept of faith, hope, and charity. For acknowledging God to be immovable, immutable, always the same, we rightly confess that he is faithful and entirely just. Hence, in assenting to his oracles, we necessarily yield to him all belief and obedience. Again, who can contemplate his omnipotence, his clemency, his willing beneficence, and not repose in him all his hopes? Finally, who can behold the riches of his goodness and love, which he lavishes on us and not love him? And that quote from the Roman Catechism is actually used in your catechism. They don't say the whole quote, but they actually use it. Um, so the, but the point that it brings out is that you can sin or violate the first commandment in three ways. More than just this, but contrary to faith, contrary to hope, and contrary to charity. Right? And so, sins against faith are when you doubt things that are revealed by God, who is the ultimate authority. Or by the church, who, which is the mouthpiece of God's authority, right? If you believe that the church is established by God um, for the continuance of his truth, then the church has the authority to, author to, to speak infallibly on matters regarding morals and faith. Okay? He didn't in other words, um, after Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He didn't leave us in the dark but the church is always with us to guide us into all truth. As our Lord himself says in the Gospel of John, right? The Holy Spirit himself will come to lead you into all truth. Um, this I found interesting. The Catechism says, if deliberately cultivated, doubt can lead to spiritual blindness. Um, I found that interesting because Father Faber, he's a, a priest. In the, uh, he was a priest in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he said, our religion is our confidence. So like, how confident 
for example, how confident we are and how much we trust God in his love for us and in his providential guidance of us to himself is the extent of how genuine our religion is. I think there are a lot of people who profess to be you know, devout Catholics who really don't trust God. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because if you really believe what the Catholic Church professes, then why would you ever doubt God? Because he is goodness itself. Love itself. Happiness itself. Like I remember I used to think, I didn't think it explicitly, but I used to think, this, I had this idea that um, salvation was like me running on an obstacle course, and God was like putting a bunch of stuff in my ways, in my way, obstacles, like trash cans, or a fire pit, or sharks. Um, and he was trying to make me fall. And I was trying to get through it. As if God was against me. I'm trying to get to him, but he's actually fighting me. <laughs> um, I remember I had a dream. And when I woke up, I realized it was the opposite. That God was behind me because he wants me to go to heaven. That was like a crazy idea to me. That God wants me to go to heaven. He desires my salvation. And he's drawing me to himself. Now, of course, we can reject that. We can deny that. But it's important to see God as on our side, right? And if God is for us, who can be against us? As St. Paul says in Romans. So, faith. Not only believing in God, but also in what his, he reveals. And perhaps most importantly, um, having the confidence of a child that he takes care of you. Right, there's like, remember this example someone told me, like a little, a little boy at the playground talking to his friend. They're seven years old. And he's like, oh, I'm so stressed out. I have to pay all these, I have to worry about all these bills, all this insurance. Cavities, not good. Um, yeah. And then the other little boy said, oh, that's interesting. My parents take care of all that. I was like, oh. We kind of live like that sometimes. Like we have to be in control, but actually God is taking care of it all. Yeah. There's a certain suavity or smoothness when someone trusts God. That's an indicator of holiness. You might have met someone like that. He kind of lives in a peace and a serenity. He's not always rushing from one thing or to the next. I've met people like that. Maybe you haven't. But hopefully you will become that. Become the change. So, then incredulity, neglect, or willful refusal to assent to reveal truth. So neglect, right, there can be willed ignorance. Someone can decide to not learn about the truths of the faith, which would be a sin. Um, right, you're not, um, no one is morally reprehensible for what they could not have known, but you can be morally responsible for the things that you could have known. Um, and especially nowadays, I notice this, um, there's a lot of indifference Am I the only one who sees that? Like when I talk to high school, high schoolers, I'm not in high school myself, but I actually meant that seriously because I know I probably look 14, but I'm not. Um, but when I talk to high schoolers or sometimes middle schoolers or I meet them, it's amazing how little they seem to care about things that matter. That's my impression. It's like, you know you're going to die, and like, if God doesn't matter, then nothing does. But like, it doesn't register for them. I wonder why. I don't know, maybe they're too comfortable. That's a different point. Anyways, hope. That's an important virtue. All right? Faith is, is the theological virtue by which we believe we assent to what God has revealed. And hope is the theological virtue by which we trust that God has the power to bring us to himself, right? 
Because ultimately the vision of God is beyond our nature. No creature by its nature can see God. Only God has the nature to see God. So to have hope, to believe that you will be able to attain the beatific vision, which again is not like babies playing harps on clouds, um, which is nice, <coughs> but not as good as seeing the vision, the face of God, right? Um, the creator of all the uncreated light. To be able to believe that you will obtain that, you have to believe that in a supernatural power guiding you to there, right? And of course, to obtain the beatific vision, you do have to cooperate with grace. And so there's a belief, there's a trust that God will guide you and will grow you gradually. That's normally how God works. He gradually grows us to adulthood in his son, Jesus Christ. And so we can sin against hope through despair and presumption. Despair, right? You believe that um, you're too much of a sinner and so God can't forgive you, which is really, um, you deny God's mercy. That's what that is, basically. Or you think you're so, your sins are so uh, huge that the God of the universe who created everything couldn't forgive you. Or that you don't have what it takes to obtain uh, eternal life. And you don't. You have to trust God. So it's again. And then there's presumption. I don't know how often I see presumption. St. Thomas Aquinas says it's a lesser sin than despair. But presumption is, is to basically presume that I'm going to be saved. Either by my own works. To not trust in God's grace. To act like I can obtain salvation through my own human virtue, without God's help, that would be presumption. Or also presumption would be, I can do whatever I want. God's going to forgive me and bring me to heaven. That's wrong. Which should be pretty self-evident, right? To presume that God will save you, um, regardless of you having no merit, and the fact that you had no virtuous life. Yeah. So it's contrary to God's justice, a presumption. And it's also not respecting your own dignity as a human person, that your actions actually matter. They have effect and meaning, and they echo throughout history. It's not, and also it's like, you know, Luther's idea that we are, we are, that uh, growth and holiness is not actual transformation where we participate with God, but it's actually covering, right, the snow-covered dung. I said that before last time, but it keeps coming up. But it's important to realize that sanctity or growth in Christ is not just him covering you, but it's you cooperating with him to actually become holy. So in other words, you don't appear holy, you actually become holy which is much more um, in congruence with the dignity of man. Hope that makes sense. Charity. What is charity? It's the virtue of loving God for his own sake and loving your neighbor as yourself. Really loving your neighbor with a divine love. right? Because it's a theological virtue, meaning it has God as its end. You love people, in a sense, for the sake of of getting them to God. And also, though, it's theological in the sense that God gives you the power to love like he does. So when you have the virtue of charity, you're actually loving someone with the love of God, which is beyond human love, mere affection. Remember, I asked somebody this. They, I said, can you distinguish when somebody is loving you from divine charity and when it's merely human affection? That's a good question. If it's really coming from a divine principle, it should have a different impact on you. So if you've ever been loved by someone in a way that um, echoes the divine, 
I mean, I think I can, I can definitely, it's difficult to articulate, but I definitely have felt that myself, where someone has loved me as if it was God loving me through them, which is what we're all called to be. That's like the, the amazing, the awesomeness of becoming saints is that we're becoming like God. That's what it means to become God-like. Right, I remember I had a priest, he said that uh, the problem with the modern world isn't so much that there's a loss of the sense of sin, which people will say a lot, like, we don't have the sense of sin anymore. That may be true. I think it is true, actually, yes. But more importantly, we've lost the sense of how amazing holiness is. And I think we don't really, yeah, because like, how I understand holiness is kind of like somebody levitating, I think. I think we have the idea that holiness is, beyond, is something inhuman, whereas it actually is the fulfillment and the completion of humanity. Right? Somebody who's holy isn't completely... Someone who's holy is also relatable. I think we have this understanding that to be a saint, you have to be completely unrelatable. You're so um, beyond the scope of humanity. But it's not. Actually, the holier you become, the more approachable you become the more relatable you become, the more human you become, right? Because to sin is not to be human. Sin is the least human thing about us. So sins against charity, indifference, like I was saying, I find that very common in, I don't know, I guess they're millennials, but I'm millennial. I don't know the generations, like when they start. Kids in high school now and below. But I guess people in their 30s are like this too. Maybe it always was like this. I don't know. I didn't take a poll, but I've seen it a lot. I know that much. <laughs> and it's not good. It's really sad, actually. Um, and lukewarmness is very similar. Yeah, man. I know a lot of people who and it's really unfortunate, like, they go to Mass on Sundays. They have families, but they don't uh, do anything else but go to Mass on Sundays. And they don't really care about God, as if the whole purpose of human life is to be united with God for all eternity. And that doesn't, like, make them... They're not um, affected by that, or they don't find that enjoyable, the idea of being with God for all eternity. They're like, I'll, I'll do, you know, my, my Sunday obligation. That's not enough, because it's not about just doing precepts, right? The Christian life is about a relationship with God. It's not really about law. It's about reintegrating the human person um, to be able to lift him up into the divine, right? Grace restores and elevates nature. So that's really sad. At least it is to me. Um, hatred of God, I don't see that that often, but that's because I am in a seminary. <laughs> I, I believe that there are people who hate God and do things out of spite to God. I mean, there are Satanists. Um, I mean, it's silly. I never quite understood. It's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot to hate your creator. Perhaps sometimes it's caused by having a, a misunderstanding of who the creator is. Not as, a, as, as love, but as a master, maybe. Sometimes we hate God, but we don't really hate God. We hate an image of God that we have. And sometimes God wants us to hate that image because he's not really God. I think part of sanctity is also growth in seeing God more as he is, purifying your image of God. Whether that's because of whether you have a distorted image because of your family history or some other event that has occurred or just it's a, something in your nature across that you have to deal with. But yeah, that's part of sanctity. It's not just, um, obviously we need to love God, but it's difficult to love God if you don't know who God is or if you, you misunderstand or misperceive who he is, which I think a lot of us do. Sometimes I think uh, like the medieval period wasn't there, 
the ancient period wasn't there, I can't say. But it seems to me that perhaps they had a better understanding of God, just intuitively. Maybe this is me being crazy, but sometimes I think that technology has affected our ability to even re relate with God. We're so inundated with man-made things. I remember recently at the seminary, the lights went out, no electricity. I know I'm going to sound crazy, but I think this is true. At least it was for me. And that wasn't like a relativistic comment. But <laughs> I experienced it. Um, yeah, the, uh, the whole electricity was out, and I was praying in the chapel, completely dark, just with the uh, sanctuary light candle. And it was cold, and you could hear. And you, know, you don't realize how much noise there is with electricity until it's completely shut down. Um, just the hum of all the wires and everything. I just remember thinking, praying there, and thinking like, wow, I feel closer, somehow closer to God, because I feel more in accord with nature. That sounds crazy maybe to you, but I really thought that. There's something about like the natural rhythm where we're not uh, inundated with electricity. Like these lights I think are very ugly. Inundated with ugliness, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. I really believe that we're inundated with ugliness. We're surrounded by ugliness, and that really makes it difficult to see the Creator as, as beautiful and as attractive. I think there's, there's an element of truth in that. Maybe not. You can disagree. Pope hasn't said anything. Catechism hasn't said anything. Um, yeah, so this is interesting. Um, this commandment does not forbid the honor and invocation of the saints and angels, nor images of Christ, saints, angels, but the worship of any... I, found it, I find it fascinating or interesting or noteworthy that the old catechism has like a whole section about how important it is to honor and plea for help from the holy angels. I love angels. I think it's something we don't talk about enough and we don't realize how um, important they are for our salvation and how they are co-shares with us in the beatific vision. Right? We're related to them. And at the end of time, we will, we will see how they have helped us. And in, in, in this catechism, it even claims that there are specific angels for countries, not just people, which I find fascinating. Um, the church usually celebrates optional memorials, so you can, if, as long as there's not an obligatory memorial on Tuesdays to the holy angels, which I plan on doing, because I love them. I remember... Um, I was seminary when I was in Columbus. I had this experience where I was having like a panic attack at night. And I remember getting on the floor and like kind of rocking. I don't know if any of you had panic attacks. This is not like me revealing anything too personal. The reason I say this is because this prayer kept this prayer came to me. I was like, whoa, where is this coming from? I just kept saying, May the holy angels surround me. May the holy angels surround me. And I just finally started to be at peace and I fell asleep finally at like 3 in the morning. But yeah. And I pray my guardian angel prayer every day. And I recommend you guys do too. Angels are really powerful because they're real. And they participate with God in his providence. Sometimes we forget that there are angels. Like the saints are great. Don't get me wrong. Huge fan of the saints but angels are also real and important, and they intercede for us. Um, right? And it's interesting how the saints don't conflict with the honor due to God, right? Because for some mysterious reason, God wants our salvation to be like a family. We participate with God in saving the world, and then even when we're dead, we can continue that participation through prayers for those who remain. It's like pretty mysterious. And I love it. We're not, we're, in other words, we're not saved as isolated units, but we're saved as one. We're connected. Everything's connected, man. Um, yeah. Other sins against the first commandment. Superstition, not good. Don't do it. What is superstition? That's like, superstition is, is when you perform some sort of external ritual and you believe that God is going to 
give you some sort of grace because of the external thing that you did without any interior disposition. So like, this is more, well I don't, I guess I don't know for a fact, but when I was in Guatemala you see this a lot, where people, um, they're a little bit more superstitious. They have like certain special candle things that they do. Um, now we, we obviously light candles to saints. That's not superstitious. But I suppose, suppose it could be. If you thought that it was the, hmm, I don't know. I have to think about that. Act like I didn't say anything. Superstition is a real thing. What's an example of superstition? I mean, obviously, like, stepping on the sidewalk crack and your mom's going to break her back. But that can obviously be proved to be false. It's other things that it can't be obviously proved. It's, the main thing is to not... Uh, act like you're in control of God, or that God cares about external rituals without the interior disposition of the heart. Right? Now, God is body and soul, so we do perform um, physical acts of devotion, but it's not like those physical acts, um, if they were void of inter internal love, um, would affect anything. It's not just the physical action, in other words. But of course, we do show our devotion to God through physical gestures. Right, because we're body and soul. We worship and by your soul. Like if you lift your hands up, or if you uh, kneel. I mean, all those are bodily postures that express our devotion to God and can be helpful. But it's not like if I do this, God's going to give me everything. Something like that. Um, yeah, not good. Other things. Yeah, divination and magic. Don't do it. Palm reading really bad. Anything that is a doorway to the occult, right, a doorway into the satanic, or really um, something where you are trying to control providence or have an unhealthy curiosity in the future that God has not given you. So really it shows a lack of trust in God's providence and in his love for you and in a desire to know more than you're supposed to. It's pride, right? So you're not accepting your limitations as a human creature. So don't divinize. Like, what's that thing? The Ouija board. Really bad. If you've seen The Exorcist, you know it's bad. <laughs> that movie freaked me out. I saw it when I was like 10. Big mistake. Don't watch it. Especially when you're 10. Maybe it's okay. I don't know. Horror movies? That's not... We're not talking about that right now. But the point is... Don't do Ouija boards. If you believe in God, why would you? So yeah, it reveals a lack of faith. All right, and then you have atheism, agnosticism, right? Obviously, those are contrary to charity and God because you don't believe in him. Or agnosticism, again, that agnosticism goes very much with indifference. I'm without knowledge, and you, you, you all, you'll often hear the, the idea, like, I'll, we can't know the truth. The idea that the human person was created and cannot know the truth, even though we have a strong desire to know the truth and to seek the truth, but it's actually not out there. So not only is that a denial of God, but it's also a denial of nature. It's contrary to nature. And of course, St. Thomas Aquinas, he'll say that, um, Sin, its definition, is anything contrary to reason, contrary to nature, um, or contrary to a divine command, right? Of course, to believe that, to have that understanding of sin, you have to have an understanding of nature, that like there is a human nature. It's not, and if you don't have that idea of nature, that there's a human nature that is objective, then how do you determine morality? You usually do it based on feelings which is purely subjective. It's not based on the nature of the human person, of, of humanness. It's based on, uh, I feel this is right, therefore it is right. And that's what's happening. There's a denial of nature. Human nature, mostly human nature, most people don't deny dog nature, or tree nature, or angelic nature. Most people are not talking about that. But is there a human nature? That's, of course, how we can relate with one another, how we can understand one another, because we share a common nature. S second commandment. 
You shall not invoke the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave unpunished anyone who invokes his name in vain. So that's from Exodus. Then we have the New Testament. But I say to you, do not swear at all, not by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more is from the evil one. And I put down below, it's this example of oaths in Scripture. The reason I put this is because that verse has been interpreted by the tradition in both the Catechism of Trent and in the Catechism you have, the, catechism, the New Catechism. Um, it doesn't mean that you can never take oaths, right? Because religious take vows, right? Of poverty, chastity, obedience. Um, and there's an example of an oath in Scripture. There are others, but here's St. Paul saying, but I call upon God as witness on my life that it is to spare you that I have not yet gone to Corinth. Um, And in the last quote, I, have t I tell you on the day of judgment, people will render an account for every careless word they speak. By your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The main thing about this is just that our words have meaning. They have significance. I mean, that's pretty... Every single word we say, God sees and hears and understands. And this used, in, the old, in olden times... In the ancient times, um, they were more focused on the power of words, right? The sin of idle words was a big thing, meaning saying a word for no reason. Like, you don't really have to talk, and you talk. That was like a venial sin, you know, might not a big sin, but a minor sin. I mean, it is, can be, when it's not done um, in a fitting circumstance. But we don't think about that. We have speech to communicate, and communicate, uh, communication is supposed to lead to communion, right? All communication ultimately is for the sake of communion, love, right? Unity. And of course, it has to be true unity, so sometimes we have to speak the truth, even though it's hard. But yeah, if our words are not leading to that communion and truth, they're ultimately in vain and useless. And we can be charged for them, right? I myself, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I say lots of things that are useless. I make mistakes, all right? Is that fair? Um, but we're supposed to be progressing in becoming holy. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't make jokes, right? It doesn't mean that you can't uh, talk to your friends about things that are not directly related to the divine. Um, but it has to be fitting to the occasion and the circumstances. Um, yeah. Right? Again, words contrary also, anything contrary to charity, but also things contrary to reason. Is this, is this reasonable for me to say this right now? Have you ever had that? Like, you're at a big dinner, and you just really want to, maybe you guys don't have this problem. <laughs> I have this problem where I say something like, I want to say this, this will be funny. It's like, uh, this really wasn't the occasion for that, James. It happens. And, you, you know, the old expression, putting your foot in your mouth. I do it a lot, right? Because it's contrary to reason, contrary to the, to the fittingness of the occasion. And also knowing your place, right? Like when I was a newly, new seminarian, being at a table with priests and kind of uh, wanting to take the floor as if I knew more than the priests, right? Not good. But that's not really what we're talking about, right? <laughs> so anyways, ways to take the Lord's name in vain. Swearing rashly. Not good. Saying, uh, supposedly, I don't know this for, the fact, for a fact, but supposedly with Martin Luther, right? Um, there's the story that lightning struck right in front of it. And at that point, or shortly after that point, he said, he uh, swore his life to God as a monk. And there were people, there, there was a priest who told him that, no, you don't have to, um, you, you shouldn't have made that vow, and you don't have to obey that vow in, in that circumstance of fear and terror, right? Um, it's, that's an example, I think, again, 
I'm pretty sure that happened, so. Look at that, I don't have the book in front of me, but. Um, taking an oath without forethought. Same thing with marriage, not just religious life. I mean, I'm sure you can think of people you know um, who entered into marriages without much preparation or forethought. They rashly went into it without um, considering the obligations or the seriousness of it. And that can happen for religious vocations also. Someone can rashly enter the religious life. Maybe it's out of fear. Like, God won't love me unless I do this, right? So I've got to vow. The principle and the motive of all of our actions should not be the passion of fear. It should, it should be the passion of, of charity. Of charity and reason. They should be the motives behind all of our actions. Not fear. Not, you know, wrath. Lust. When they become the driver, that's when we make mistakes. That's when we err. That's when we act contrary to nature, the nature of things. All right. Swearing falsely, really bad. Like in a court of law, putting your hand on the Bible and swearing something that actually isn't true, that means you're calling on God as a witness to a lie. Very serious. I believe perjury is a sin that cries to heaven, too. Um, so don't do that. I don't think any of you will. I don't know you very well, I presume. You're here, right? Yeah, don't do that. Unjust oaths. That's like, um, right, Herod in the scriptures. When he tells Herodias, the girl who danced in front of him, like, I'll give you anything you want. And she asks for the head of John the Baptist. He says, oh, well, I did tell her that I would give her anything she wanted. Even so, he should not have cut John the Baptist's head off. <laughs> that was an unjust oath. So Herod, he made a mistake, you know. <laughs> Who doesn't? Um, that was a sin, you know. I can't judge him. The end of time, it will all be revealed, his full culpability, whether there was some psychological, uh, I don't know. Anyways, oaths by false gods, okay, obviously, you don't take oaths about things that aren't real. These are from the Catechism of Trent. They have like a list. Irreverent speech. That's taking, I mean, obviously, I think the, when people hear uh, taking the Lord's name in vain, they usually think of like, you know, saying, saying the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, in a way that is flippant or um, that doesn't um, express the seriousness or the profundity of who, who he is. Like, I, this isn't um, speech, but uh, someone sent me this picture, emailed me this picture and asked me my thoughts on it. Um, it was a picture of Jesus, but he was wearing a Trump hat make America great again. And he emailed me, he said, is this wrong? And I said, here's my opinion, my two cents. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think it's wrong because I think it, um, re it cheapens and it reduces the God-man. Jesus Christ is not just some pious teacher from the past. He, he is God incarnate. And we're supposed to love him and know him. Like, there, we just got an email from the seminary. Some guy was up in the airport, and he saw this ice cream place called Sweet Jesus. And he, he emailed all of us and said that he found it offensive. And I can understand that. Right? It's acting like Jesus. I mean, if we really loved Jesus, and we really knew him as God and man who died for our salvation, we wouldn't, we wouldn't use his name in such a cheap way. I think part of the problem, why we're prone to use his name in vain or use it in a way that is cheap is because we don't really know him. 
Like when you love your friend and you know your friend, um, you don't treat his name like that. Because as the Catechism says later on, like the name is the icon of a person. I like that expression, the icon. It represents who you are. And so to revere the name is to revere the person. Just like when you revere an icon, you're actually revering the saint it represents. I like that. Um, I found this interesting in the Catechism of, of Trent, neglect of prayer. Now obviously you're not saying anything, but yet it's taking the Lord's name in vain. I find that fascinating. I mean, obviously it means to, uh, we don't glorify God by not praying to him. There's one, I don't know the number of the psalm, but I think every time as a priest, um, priests have to pray this, pray the psalms every day. Um, and the psalm, not all of them every day, but through a four-week cycle. But the psalm that always hits me the most as the most painful, like it hurts to even say it. There's a line in one of the psalms where it says, they never pray to God. That always hurts me the most. Like I remember I was telling somebody, I said, this person was super busy all the time. Had no time for relationships. Which of course, all work is for the sake of relationships, not the other way around. But I told her, you know, you might have more time if you devoted more time to prayer. I had a sense that this person didn't pray much. But they were at least Catholic in name. And I remember she laughed at my face. <laughs> and like on, re on reflection, like she was like, that's the most ridiculous thing. Praying to God would actually help me. <laughs> but if you think about that, that's what a mockery of God. God couldn't possibly help me, as if God isn't all powerful. And as a priest and as a parent, perhaps the mo most important part of your ministry is prayer, is entering into union with, with the divine. Because the, the closer you are to God, the more you can see all of these human conundrums in a divine light. And it can give you prudence and counsel and guidance to orient all things to the ultimate end, which is God himself. Really, the union of all human beings in God himself. That's what the church is the reunited family in God, the definitive family. Um, blasphemy. Using God's name to curse God, or cursing God, it's obviously really wrong. I, don't, I think that's pretty self-evident, I would think. But you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of expressions we use nowadays. I mean, you hear it a lot, using uh, the Lord's name in vain. And I'll as an example, right? Oh my God. You hear that a lot. Is that wrong? My opinion? Yes. Because, I don't say it but I never like to hear it um, because it's always used in a way that is not in accord with the profundity of who God is. And again, I think using the Lord's name in vain has become so second nature to our culture. And even in those who are faithful, who are Catholic, and that is, I think, primarily due to the fact that we don't know God. And of course, you, you begin to know who God is through prayer. So when you don't know God, you don't think it's a big deal to use his name in vain. Right? It's one of the hardest things to do is to help people fall in love with God. That's the priest's job. Because so many people don't see God as attractive. But he, but he is. And I can't show it to you. You have to experience it yourself. Right? It has to be a grace from outside of yourself. That's like Jeremiah, he says, um, I will inscribe upon their hearts a new law. Right? That means even the way we act has to be 
has to transform us, but it can't come from ourselves alone. God has something external to us has to help us not only act right, but also to see God aright. And even ourselves, like St. Augustine says in Book 10 of the Confessions, he says, all that I know about myself, I know from, from your light. Only when we properly see God do we even properly see ourselves in that relation. And all of the lies about our identity, that's a big thing now, right? No one knows who they are. How can you know who you are if you don't have a relationship with your Creator? Or, or good relationships even with your family or friends? And when you distort relationships, when you have bad relationships, you distort your identity. Because a person's identity is intrinsically bound up with their relation to others. You don't find yourself in isolation to others. You find yourself in relation to them. Especially in the family. By the way, how many people here like music? I know some people actually don't. Well, everybody likes music, but some people are like not really that into it. It's a beautiful piece of music. You don't have to raise your hands. I saw some nods. There's a beautiful piece of music called uh, from Messiaen. He's a French composer, Oliver Messiaen. Most of this, most of the um, composition is is a little weird. It's bizarre. But it's called the String Quartet for the End of Time. And he wrote it when he was in prison camp in World War II. And uh, the last movement, which is um, I'm trying to, I can't remember the, it's the eighth movement, the eighth track on the CD up here. Praise to the Eternity of Jesus, I think is what it's called. Praise to the Eternity of Jesus, the last movement. Um, to me, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. The reason I bring it up is just because the idea of ascending into the love of God, into the heart of God, and His love for you, that song for me, reflects that very well. But it might not be your taste. But it might be. Just the thought. Third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you may labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, either you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your work animal, or the resident alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And then, from the New Testament, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That is why the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then there's a quote from St. John Paul II's encyclical on, the, on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Um, but these two quotes from the Old and from the New are important because the celebration of Sunday is not the Sabbath. We no longer observe the Sabbath. Now you might have met some people called the Seventh-day Adventists who say, why don't you observe the Sabbath? It's a command. Well, I'm going to let you know why. And it makes sense. Um, so first of all, Sunday, right? The Sabbath was the commemoration of the, or the remembrance. Notice how the word is remember the Sabbath day. It's a remembering the creation. Remembering the beauty of creation and the fact that we have a creator. Right? So Sunday, which is, now, which is called the Lord's Day, is a remembering a commemoration of the recreation in Christ, right? That's why we go to Mass also, because it makes present, it represents the sacrifice and the resurrection, where we partake, um, we, we partake of Christ and are risen with Him. So, Sunday's not the Sabbath, but the fulfillment of the Sabbath, and it should be called rather the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. In Dies Domini, the encyclical means the Lord's Day. Um, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you guys have read that, but just for your easy view, or if you haven't, I know you have the Catechism, right? So, like, I don't have to read it. Um, but, okay, 
where's this proof that why is the Sabbath, why do we not celebrate the Sabbath, even though we follow all the rest of the commandments? James, can you explain this? Because you don't seem smart. Well, I'm going to tell you that I am smart, at least to some degree, and I have proofs. First of all, from Scripture. Acts 27. On the first day of the week, when we gathered to break bread. Mm, interesting. First day. Now, why do we call it the first day? Right? Because it's the renewal. It's the recreation. The first day because it's the new day. The day where we commemorate the fact that we have made partakers of the divine nature through Jesus Christ. There's a newness to that. That we, don't, that we very much underappreciate. We get to participate in the divine nature and to see God as he is. And so in that day, that occurred on the resurrection. The newness of the human vocation to share in the life of God, which is beyond any created nature. First Corinthians. On the first day of the week, each of you should set aside and save whatever he can afford. Interesting, first day. Colossians, let no one then pass judgment on you in matters of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are shadows of things to come. The reality belongs to Christ. Revelations. Revelations, sorry, Revelation or the Apocalypse, if you want to go old school. I was caught up in spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a voice as loud as a trumpet. And then I'm not going to read all this, but there's a lot of proof from the early church fathers that this was always the custom. Um, that the Sabbath was no longer observed because it was a ceremonial law, not a natural law. Right? So like, do not kill is contrary to the nature of man. But ceremonial precepts are things like sacrificing bulls or goats in the Old Covenant, right? Those were ceremonial precepts that were shadows of the thing to come, which was Christ, the true sacrifice. And there are lots of other, uh, other laws, right? Circumcision was one that was usurped from the advent of Christ, right? So you got a lot of that stuff. Council, here's a council of the church, Canon 29, I'll read that one. Christians should not Judaize and should not be idle on the Sabbath, but should work on that day, so Saturday. They should, however, particularly reverence the Lord's day and, if possible, not work on it because they were Christians. Okay, And then St. Augustine, Well, now I should like to be told what there is in these Ten Commandments, except the observance of the Sabbath, which ought not to be kept by a Christian. Right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of proof of that from the Scripture and the early Church Fathers and the later Church Fathers. And then I quoted the Catechism of the Council of Trent, um, where they talk about the difference between that commandment to observe the Sabbath and the other commandments that are contrary to, that are not only, um, they were given by God, but they also can be found if you truly understand the nature of man. Right? Jews weren't the only ones who knew that killing was wrong. There's something intrinsic to human nature that understands, that is self-evident, that killing another human person is wrong, contrary to nature. Okay? But, as the second quote from the Catechism of the Council of Trent says, the worship of God and the practice of religion, which it comprises, have the natural law for their basis. Nature prompts us to give some time to the worship of God. This is demonstrated by the fact that we find among all nations public festivals consecrated to the solemnities of religion and divine worship. As nature requires some time to be given to necessary functions of the body, to sleep, repose, and the like, so she also requires that some time be devoted to the mind to refresh itself by the contemplation of God. Hence, since some time should be devoted to the worship of the deity and to the practice of religion, this commandment doubtless forms part of the moral law. So it is a part of the moral law to worship God, but it is not part of the natural law um, to worship God on Saturday. Right? And Christ is God, so he can change the day. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. Um, good. Yes, yeah, it says, neither, it's not a principle of natural law. I don't need to say that. Yeah. Okay, what does this commandment mean practically? 
Good question. I'm glad you asked. How am I supposed to observe the Sabbath? Slash not the Sabbath, because that's not what it is. It's the Lord's Day. Well, I'm going to tell you. First of all, canon law. This is the ecclesiastical law of the church. So this is human law, right? But it has authority, right? Human law has authority. We, and we, we owe uh, obedience to it, right? Um, it says, on Sundays and other holy days of obligation, the faithful are obliged to participate in the Mass. Moreover, they are to abstain from those works and affairs which hinder the worship to be rendered to God, the joy proper to the Lord's Day, or the suitable relaxation of mind and body. All right. Now you'll know, as I go through this, the church doesn't really say um, explicitly what not to do and what to do. It kind of leaves it up to your own prudential judgment. But there, are a, there is a principle behind it. The principle is that Sunday is meant to be the time where you remember the fact that God died for you and has given you eternal life. So especially time devoted to God, the worship of God, obviously the public worship of God in the Mass, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So you, and you can't replace the Mass with like a Protestant service or anything. Um, Prayer, study, but also it's a day of rest, so relaxation and fun, right? Um, yeah, and of course there are times where you might not be able to go to Mass, um, weird situations, right? An, an impossible law does not bind though, like let's say you're on a cruise and there's no mass and you forgot on Sunday and you can't go to mass. Well, it's not a sin because you did not will it. Sin is always in the will. But you do need to prepare for these things, right? Um, we need to realize how important it is to worship God. And we should take delight in worshiping God. But I don't think we do. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. But ultimately, it should be a great joy to come together as a family to worship our Creator. That's all I'll say. Um, catechism. On Sundays and other holy days of obligation, the faithful are to refrain from engaging in work or activities that hinder the worship owed to God, the joy proper to the Lord's Day, the performance of the works of mercy, and the appropriate relaxation of mind and body. Family needs or important so social services can legitimately excuse from the obligation of Sunday rest. The faithful should see to it that legitimate excuses do not lead to habits prejudicial to religion, family life, and health. The charity of truth seeks holy leisure. The necessity of charity accepts just work. So, here's a good question. What should you do on Sunday? Obviously go to Mass, but what else? Well, you should refrain from servile labor within reason. Some people have to, and there are some jobs that require it. Um, and actually, the next page, the last page, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2187. Sanctifying Sundays and Holy Days requires a common effort. Every Christian should avoid making unnecessary demands on others that would hinder them from observing the Lord's Day. Traditional activities, sport, restaurants, etc., and social necessities, public services, require some people to work on Sundays. But everyone should still take care to set aside sufficient time for leisure. With temperance and charity, the faithful will see to it that they avoid the excesses and violence sometimes associated with popular leisure activities. In spite of economic constraints, public authorities should ensure citizens a time intended for rest and divine worship. Employers have a similar obligation toward their employees. So here's a good question. Um, we should be cultivating in our own lives and in our culture um, a sacred time, preserving a sacred time on Sundays for the worship of God and the intimacy of his family. So is it wrong to make someone else work on Sundays by going shopping on Sundays? 
What if you have, uh, okay, what about like going to the movies? Legitimate recreation, someone has to work. But of course, restaurants, you gotta eat. But of course people have to work. So what's the solution? Your thoughts? Maybe it's... Now, according to this, it would seem that it's fine, within reason, according to the catechism, right? If, so, if traditional activities such as sports and restaurants and social necessities, like hospitals, right, require some people to work on Sundays, then presumably people are going to them. But perhaps it should say, um, if you can do it on a day that's not Sunday, that's ideal, um, as far as, like, um, necessities of the body. So like shopping for clothes and food, ideally they should be done not on Sunday. Now legitimate recreation, like going to the movies or going to a roller rink. No one does that anymore. <laughs> but I did growing up. What do people do now? I don't know. They do things that cost money, though, I presume, right? I think that's fine. Let's ask Father Barnes. <laughs> I saw him. So, what's your opinion? Legitimate recreation on Sundays? Let's see. You go to the movies, but someone has to work. So you're supporting work. Wait, you think it's okay? So there, you got his... I think it's probably okay. Oh, it is okay. It says it's okay. Just don't do it immoderately. I guess don't focus so much on having fun that you um, hinder the main object of Sunday, which is the glory of God and a deeper knowledge and love of God. And of course, that can be gained through things other than silent meditative prayer. But Sunday should be a special time of prayer, not just public worship of the church through the Mass, but especially within your families, Sunday, great day to pray the family rosary, for example, or even just a decade. The rosary, I love it. Now, to be fair, I don't like praying it with other people. So maybe your kids will be like me. <laughs> it's like my favorite prayer, but I don't like praying it with other people. I pray it silently. It actually helped me a lot, like when I came back to the church. When you don't believe in God, you tend towards vice and viciousness, and you, uh, a lot of habits contrary to reason are established, and to reverse them is very difficult. But the rosary did it for me in like a matter of weeks. It was amazing. Huge fan, because right, Our Lady is a powerful intercessor. She's the mother of God. It's real. Um, but yeah, prayer, family prayer, really important. You don't have to do the rosary, but uh, any other prayers. But to show, that, to show your kids that you believe in God enough to pray together with them. And to show them that you have a relationship with God is really important. Because if they see that your relationship with God does not have priority, or is just an obligatory attendance of Mass or something, um, they're, they're, not going to, they're not going to take religion seriously if you don't. It's just true. That's part of the reason why we have so many teenagers that don't believe anything. Is unfortunately because the parents don't believe anything. Just by appearance, they might. It's not the only reason, though. You can have very faithful parents, and the kids still turn away because they also have free will. That's the mystery. Right? So it's not always that. I don't want to be like, parents are always the worst. Kids are never wrong. But, I mean, you have, uh, there's an important obligation on the family, um, right? When you have children, part of the responsibility is upbringing or educatio, to draw out from your kids their own faith, to teach them religion. You're the primary educators of your children, not the school or not a nanny or something. So you got to take that seriously. Because, like, 
through marriage, you bring new, you cooperate with God in bringing new people into the mystical body. But if you don't um, simultaneously actually teach them in the faith, then they become dead members of the body. That's not good. Because you want them united with you, not just now, but in eternity. That's the, the best gift you can give to your children is your own relationship with God. Which will be unique to each one of you. Right? God creates no duplicates because to be a person is to be thoroughly specific. Okay. Father Barnes answered my question. Which, that's what I thought. Just making sure. So I think I'm good. Any questions about the Sabbath? But yeah, try not to work on the Sabbath. Unless you have to. I don't know how strong that necessity needs to be. Father Barnes can talk about that later. But you got more information here. I just gave you what the church says. So if the church has, you know, leaves it open to prudential judgments, then I guess you can do that, right? I can't be stricter than the church or looser. Is that pretty good? That's a virtue. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've given us. Help us to delight in being your children, and to see you as you are. To know that you are love, and that we are your beloved sons and daughters. Please bring us all into heaven with the saints and the angels beholding your face forever. We love you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.